here. This is really time so interestingly. Uh, obviously, the sights of, of yesterday were very, very disturbing to many, many people. We really appreciate you being here this morning and uh, just, just want to say thanks. And, and we want to thank partnering with the Waukee Chamber, the Clive Chamber, and the Windsor Heights Chamber of Commerce for this event. I cannot wait to hear more. Um, and Andrea Woodward with the Greater Des Moines Partnership, thank you so much for your expertise and excellence. We are very excited about you moderating this event. So you are, you're going to be incredible, I know. So we have so many people that I want to recognize that are on this Zoom call this morning. It's, it's quite quite amazing. Renee Hardman just joined us. Renee, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Angela Connolly, thank you. We are just, we are so proud that you're here this morning. Susan Judkins, Mary Kramer. Uh, I know I saw Mary, there she is. Yep, Mary's on the line. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, we have our board chair for 2021, Therese Wilagi is on the line with us today. And our past board chair, uh, the amazing Chris Nelson is also here. There are many board members from all of our chambers that are also represented. So thank you so much, chambers, members, and uh, incredible people of, of this region. So really appreciate it. I also wanna recognize our team that works tirelessly to help support our businesses right now. This is a super challenging time for our small businesses, our medium and some of our large businesses. So thank you to our team to really help prop and lift up our community during these crazy challenging times. So everything we're doing this year, all of our programming and all of our events revolves around four pillars that we think is super important for us and our community this year. And those four pillars that we are focusing on is progress, positivity, possibility, and perseverance. Those are four things that we all as a community and as individuals need to focus on for 2021. You know, we didn't just flip a switch and boom, you know, the, the sky is parting and, uh, and COVID is over, right? No, this is, this is the long haul. But as we handle all of our programming and all of our panelists and everything we do this year is gonna be revolving around that. So we are excited for you to plug in. And Kara, thanks for mentioning our Inspire 2021 event, our MLK event coming up as well, and so much more to come. So we are proud that you're here and we want to start our programming and thank you so much for all your support and all of our amazing legislatures today. So thank you, Bailey. Yes, thank you so much, Catherine, for that, that uh, intro. Um, I wanted to just kick off the prog programming um, with our normal structure for all of our events. Um, if everyone could please just keep their mics muted and submit any questions that you have via the chat box. Um, Andrea Woodward, Woodard, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Andrea Woodard <laughs> <All good>. um, <laughs> is going to be moderating this event today. Um, and so I just want to hand it over to her and thank her again for joining us. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, you know, that's what I get when I decided to take my spouse's last name as is uh, misspellings occasionally, which I, I don't mind. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join you all today. Thank you to the teams at the Clive Chamber, the Waukee Chamber, West Des Moines Chamber, and Windsor Heights Chamber for offering this important platform for your members to hear from those representing you all in the upcoming legislative session. I'd like to welcome our elected leaders, Senator Claire Selsey, Senator-elect Sarah Trone Garriott, Representative Keenan Judge, Representative and House Minority Whip Jennifer Comfers, and Representative Kristen Sundy. And as Bailey said, I'm Andrea Woodard. I lead government affairs at the Greater Des Moines Partnership. We're the regional economic and community development organization covering 10 counties in central Iowa, representing 6,500 regional business members and 365 plus investors, which makes us the fourth largest chamber of commerce in the country. And I just wanna take a minute or brief minute or two to kind of set the stage for this morning's conversation before asking each of our guests to introduce themselves and offer any couple of opening remarks they'd like. Uh, as a supporter, the partnership as a supporter of the Robert D and Billy Ray Center's Show Some Respect campaign, the partnership likes to remind all of our members and investors the importance of civility in our policy events. Uh, advancing meaningful conversation requires civility, and we urge all Iowans to be respectful and to nurture and uh, to nurture the Iowa nice reputation during these politically charged times. And I think uh, I wrote this the other day, and, and that is no more true 
then than it is today and, and probably even more so after uh, yesterday's events in, in Washington, DC. And so I'm, I'm sure those sentiments will be shared from our, our guests today. But I also want to acknowledge with this esteemed group of elected leaders, we, we are only hearing today from one uh, political party being that that's who represents the, the area that we are, are with today. And what you'll likely hear from each of them is how much of the work accomplished at the Iowa Capitol is bipartisan and largely supported by most or all members of the Iowa legislature. It's often the controversial language the public hears most about. And and so we'll be focusing the questions on the goals of the legislators with us today, along with the goals of their caucuses. We encourage all of you to reach out to them and other legislators throughout the state to share your feedback and ask your questions. It's important to build relationships on both sides of the political aisle. So with that, we'll start by offering each legislator an opportunity to introduce themselves and offer opening remarks. We'll then turn to the questions that were submitted in advance. And as you have other questions, please uh, post those in, in the chat function and, and we'll get to those as well. And then uh, at the end, probably around 8 um, 8.50-ish, we'll offer each of them a chance to offer any closing remarks before we end at 8.55, and, and Catherine uh, will, will wrap us up if that frog doesn't return. So uh, with that, I'd like to start with uh, House Minority Whip Representative Jennifer Comfers. Go ahead and kick us off. Good morning. Thanks, everyone, for having us. We're so glad to be here and uh, uh, have this chance. I know last year and the years before we've really enjoyed this opportunity and it's too bad we can't be in person, but we all say that at every meeting. So I won't take too much time. My name is Jennifer Confirst and I represent uh, all of Windsor Heights, the Polk County part of Clive and Northern West Des Moines. And I'm thrilled to be starting my second term. And yes, I am the minority whip in the Iowa House, which essentially means deputy leader um, or uh, sort of also trying to help guide this caucus through through the next legislative session and, and making sure that your voices are heard at the Capitol as well. So um, I am also a professor at Drake. And so I'm thrilled that Drake isn't starting until February 1st this year so that we could get a little legislature under our belt. You know, um, we can talk about our, our priorities and things as we go forward, but I just wanted to let you know that um, what Andrea said about bipartisanship is true. We are trying to do as much work as we can across the aisle. COVID is not a partisan issue. And so, we know that everything we do in the legislature this year will be seen through the lens of COVID. And so we're gonna work very hard to advance whatever we need to do to help Iowa get back on the road to recovery, to help kids get back in school safely, to make sure small businesses stay open or can reopen safely to support families and to make sure that workers are safe. So all those things I think are things we can all agree on. So I'm happy to take any questions, but um, I'll try to try to wrap up my opening there. Thank you, Representative. Next, can we hear from Senator Claire Selsey? Good morning. I echo Jennifer's comments. Thank you for uh, being here this morning. And um, I'm thrilled to be a part of this delegation representing uh, West Des Moines. Uh, I represent the southern half of West Des Moines uh, in Pony and uh, the west side of Des Moines, as well as a sliver of Warren County. Uh, where the town of Cumming is. Um, I'm, I'm serving on the Appropriations Committee, the Admin and Reg Subcommittee, which kind of governs some of the executive uh, branch budget sub, you know, committees, uh, education, natural resources, state government, and then I just became the ranking member of the Government Oversight Committee in the Senate. Um, some of my priorities this session will be making sure that we're representing equity in all things, not just certain bills, but that all bills that we examine in the Senate have equity included in them. And, and I'm gonna be pushing for a minority impact statement on all of our bills to see uh, what the impact on uh, communities of color will be both fiscally and you know, realistically. Um, how feasible are these bills? and what can we do to make them more equitable throughout the state. Uh, COVID relief, as Representative Comfers mentioned, um, I'm focusing mostly on food, rent, and utilities, the basics of life. Um, we really need to make sure our people are okay during the pandemic. Basically, every, in every bill too, I'll be looking for more local control, this year especially for our school boards. Um, 
we saw some local control slippage last year again. And I really wanna give school boards autonomy in figuring out uh, how to move forward with COVID in the schools. And then also um, spending our gigantic billion dollar piggy bank that we've created on our budget priorities, clean water, uh, public education, and um, making sure that we're covering mental health costs in our state. Those are my priorities this year, and I look forward to your questions toward the um, end of the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Next, Representative Keenan Judge. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kenan Judge. Um, I represent uh, Waukee, West Des Moines, and Clive, uh, all just Dallas County parts of those. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm my wife, Kathy, and I have been married for 37 years. We've uh, raised four daughters here in Waukee schools. Uh, very proud of that. Um, I had a 38-year uh, career with Hy-Vee um, and retired in uh, January of 16. Um, I'm serving my uh, second term in the Iowa House, and uh, where, where I'm serving at, uh, as far as the committees I'm on, I'm ranking member of Ag, Commerce, Economic Growth, uh, Natural Resources, and the uh, Economic Growth Budget. So I am um, looking forward to getting back on Monday. And uh, thanks to the West Des Moines Chamber for hosting this and, and for the Clive uh, uh, Waukee, West Des Moines, and then the Windsor Heights Chambers for being in attendance. So thank you so much. It's, I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Senator-elect Trungariot. Am I saying that right, Senator? Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Trungariot. Um, I will be representing Clive, Windsor Heights, Waukee, and parts of West Des Moines in Senate District 22. This is my first session, so I'll be sworn in on Monday. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to represent a voice that I feel like maybe doesn't get a lot of opportunity in the legislature of working parents, um, of working families who have really been impacted by COVID. And this pandemic, both my husband and I are working from home. We've got two kids in elementary school who are trying to do online education. Um, it was really hard for working families before, and it's even harder now not having um, those usual things that can help you make it through the week, um, you know, to be able to access your public education in the same way, to not have family and friends, to be able to come and help out, to not be able to get babysitters, even because of the pandemic. And I think the pandemic has revealed a lot of things that were always true, which was that public education is so vital to our economy, to our communities, and we really need to fund it in a way that shows that, that importance, that how central it is to almost everything in our state. And I'm on the education committee, so that's an opportunity to work on how do we support schools with all of the changes that COVID has brought and how the funding formula might not really meet the needs as COVID has presented so many changes. Um, enrollments are way down. A lot of kindergartners have been redshirted. And since we base funding on the previous year's enrollment, that doesn't really work because of what we've just been through. And thinking about how we can help catch up kids who have lost ground um, and support educators who are just exhausted from trying to teach and trying to um, help their, their communities in a brand new way. A lot of educators said it's like their first year of teaching all over again. I also serve on the Human Resources Committee. And for me, access to healthcare and public health measures are really, really essential. Every choice we make impacts our neighbors and access to um, those are really important health resources. It impacts our whole community. And so how can we strengthen public health and make sure that uh, our neighbors truly have access to what they need? And as we see the vaccine being rolled out, that's, that's a really important consideration. Counties like Polk that have a very large concentration of healthcare providers should be getting more support to make sure that we can vaccinate quickly as many people as possible because we serve such a large area of the state. And I'm the ranking member on natural resources. And during this time of the pandemic, we've seen how important 
public spaces are, green spaces, um, thinking about ways that we can support those and those green spaces, especially in my district, um, especially for the city of Clive, are really important as a way to mitigate flooding and to help support water quality. And so how can we um, really invest in our green spaces in our state to support um, all of those other benefits that come with them? Thank you, Senator. Uh, last but not least, Representative Kristen Sundy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you and really great to see so many familiar faces and names on the screens. Uh, I am Kristen Sunday. I represent sort of the southern part of West Des Moines in Polk County, so a little bit south of uh, Representative Confirst District and to the east of uh, Representative Judges. I kind of say it starts at Glen Oaks and heads all the way down to Valley Junction. Um, and also uh, much of the community of Cumming in Warren County. Um, I just wanna echo my colleagues, they've touched on a lot of really important topics that we're planning on talking about this year. I think the vaccination program and rollout in Iowa is one of the most important things that uh, we need to be addressing here because that's how our state is gonna get back to normal. Um, and I also hope that we'll all be able to head to the Capitol together, my Democratic colleagues, my Republican colleagues, and, and start from a place of understanding that extremes and absolutes just don't work that well uh, in governing. And so we have to understand that, that um, everything's got shades of gray. And so we understand that people can be worried about their health and safety, but also worried about um, their financial security in this pandemic. There just, there aren't absolutes and there's room for, you know, more than one feeling and approach to how we manage um, the pandemic and recovering. And so um, hopefully we can come together to look at, you know, what's best for the broadest group of people and, and try to move forward that way. Um, like my colleagues said, ensuring that our school districts have flexibility and have the funding that they need to get through this. Also ensuring that all of our communities, rural and urban, have um, excellent and affordable access to internet. High-speed internet is gonna be really important, so I hope we can address that. And then of course, there are you know, all of the things that we should be talking about. How do we fight climate change? How do we ensure we have clean water in Iowa? How do we have um, you know, support for small businesses so they can continue to uh, invest and thrive in our communities? And um, you know, how do we have a welcoming state for all Iowans where people feel like they're uh, treated fairly and with respect. So there's a lot to do. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, this will be my second term and um, can't wait to dive in on Monday. So thanks for having me this morning. Thank you. And I think what we're going to do for the uh, pre-submitted questions and, and those that are coming in on the chat is I'll, I'll start with someone and then open it up to the others uh, who might want to add. And that way if you don't have anything different you want to add, that's okay, but we'll, we'll go that route to, to start. So the first question is uh, really as it relates to uh, pre-K through uh, K-12 education and what, what some of you have already mentioned this, what is currently being discussed in terms of whether it's funding or support for uh, the costs that, that we've incurred from COVID and, and just the, the overall state supplemental aid. Can you talk about what you're hearing and, and what we might expect to see in the um, early days of the legislative session? And, and I'm gonna start with uh, Senator Selsey, if you can kick us off and then we'll open it up. Thank you very much, Andrea. I am hearing a couple of things. One, that we will hold harmless school districts and adjust the uh, way that they count students uh, this year. In other words, revert back to the previous year. That's one option that's being discussed. Another one is to um, use federal aid to backfill some of our state um, costs that are being incurred by our school districts. There's another one that's being discussed by the Iowa Association of School Boards. And I still need to get more information on that one before I'm able to discuss it, but maybe Representative Kong first or one of my colleagues can discuss that one in more detail. But there is discussion on um, making our districts um, more whole with regard to the drop in, in enrollment. Um, 
I'm hoping that that does not include a property tax increase. I don't think anyone wants to see that happen. So I'll just be quiet now, let this move on to someone else. Thank you, Senator. Who else would like to speak to the what you're hearing on K-12? You know, I would like to, to chime in because this is a, I'm Ken and Judge, this is a very uh, important topic to me. Uh, I think uh, education, it all starts and ends with that. And that should be our uh, one of our top, top priorities. And, and I'm going to talk about funding it properly. Um, and when people say we need more money for education, I like to tell them what it's for. And that's for uh, increased funding for making sure we have our class sizes throughout this state in uh, correctly, lower class sizes, making sure that we have what teachers need to, to be effective. And then classes, different uh, classes that schools can offer to get our kids ready for this workforce if they have the funding needed. Um, I believe uh, teachers are the heart of this in the heart of the classroom. And they deserve uh, our best pay we can give them. And that all starts with funding. So I like, to, I like to say, instead of we just need more money, here's what we need it for. And uh, I'll also say that uh, from an economic background, this is the engine that drives our state. Uh, it's, a, it's a great equalizer for everyone, uh, no matter what zip code you come out of. And if we, we to me, it deserves the first bite out of the apple, and uh, we need to need to make sure that we go, go in there and fund our public education to the point uh, it needs to be to be successful. So I appreciate you letting me chime in. Absolutely, thank you, Representative Judge. Or any anything to add from anyone? Um, so there are the issues that are specific to COVID um, that we need to adjust for because we know in the business world, you can't just keep going as business as usual when the world is not normal. You have to adjust um, so that your business can succeed. The same is true for education. So we have to make some changes to adjust for what COVID has done to our school systems. But funding overall has been too low for too long. And so in West Des Moines Community School District where my kids are enrolled, um, they couldn't hire more teachers to provide education. So the class sizes are still very large in person and online. Um, my third graders class has 31 kids in it for an online class. Trying to manage that many children online is just too much um, to do it well. It's just too much to ask of any educator. Um, it's too much to ask of those kids um, to try to be in school online like that. And so um, the state supplemental aid is what helps to provide that funding for the people. And we need more funding, um, a higher level of funding increase so that we can um, support the people who are providing the education to our students. Um, and in West Des Moines, because they just haven't had um, enough funding to truly pay for the cost of education. They've been dipping into their reserves and now they're going to really have to um, rein in their spending in a, in a pretty significant way because they can't keep doing that. And so we need to see a change in state supplemental funding. Thank you, Senator. Any, Andrea, the only, the only thing I'll add, I know we wanna be, we wanna move on to the next question, but the only thing I'll add is that this entire education funding debate will be wrapped up in the idea of um, getting kids back to school. And so they're, they're gonna be unable, it's not gonna be possible to untangle them. And so we're gonna wanna make sure that we're, um, I'm focused on making sure that local control as, as um, we've heard earlier today is maintained. School districts can make their own decisions, but um, funding is going to be tied up in this discussion about getting kids back to school safely. To be clear, I don't know of anybody who wants kids learning online at home. I know everybody wants their kids to go back to school. The biggest part is making sure that they can do that safely. And that's where some of this conflict comes from. But when we're talking about um, school aid and, and funding, this it, idea will be wrapped up in the same conversation. So just something to be prepared for. 
Thank you. So maybe uh, what we'll do is the next question, which is a, a pre-submitted question, we'll start with Representative Sunday, and, and I'm combining a, a couple. Uh, the question is about getting involved. It's, it's both, uh, what is a good first step for someone looking to get involved in politics? What are, and knowing there are sometimes barriers of entry facing groups of individuals who want to get involved, how, how does one um, make the time to do it? But I'm, I'm gonna add in kind of a, a legislative tie in there is, particularly right now with the pandemic and how are how can we best communicate with you all when you're up at the Capitol? And so really just a, a broad uh, question about getting involved and communicating with you during this upcoming legislation, legislature, excuse me, if you can uh, address that, that would be great. Representative. Sure, let me start um, first just with how to best be in touch with us because that's an easy one. Um, if a constituent emails me or calls me and, and lets me know I live in your district, here's something that I care about and they write you know, their own words in a note, you know, in a, in a letter to me even, I am responding. So getting that kind of personal touch, we get a lot of those sort of um, fill in your name, fill in the blanks kind of emails that are, are generated like mass emails. And um, those are sometimes a little, not as, uh, they're not answered first when they drop into my inbox. And so if you send me a note and let me know that I'm in your district and I care about this or leave me a voicemail, I will get back to you. So that, so please reach out anytime. And I know my colleagues do the same. Um, as far as getting involved, you know, there are so many, there are so many ways you can start. There are all kinds of um, nonprofit organizations that you can dive into and, and find leadership roles on boards, um, you know, different committees with the city. Um, you know, I, I had some of my own professional um, board experience and then, uh, you know, did my foster care work, which really was the one thing that led me to wanting to um, be a legislator. And so I would say that whatever it is that you're passionate about and you care about it, that experience will lend itself to work that you can do as a legislator. So don't, don't feel like there's some prescribed path that you need to take. Whatever it is that is sort of in your heart that you care about, that you can be passionate about and make a difference about is where you should be and be working there. And then you'll be able to take what you've learned um, and you know, and you can translate that into public service at different levels. Um, so I'd say go for what, what you love and what's most important to you. Thank you, Representative. Who would like to add on to that? I've I lost a have, couple of you in my screen. I do have a couple of, Thanks, Senator. of yes. um, examples on how you can get involved. Uh, one is being on boards, um, especially nonprofit boards and business boards um, in the state, and then also state boards and county boards. Um, I served for five years each on two different state boards, and that gave me a really great, um, really great experience in uh, procedure. Um, you know, being the chair of a board is very similar to being the chair of a, a committee in that you have to organize yourself, create an agenda, things like that. So it gives you experience. It lets you meet other people from all around the state, which is another feature of serving in state government or any government. And I think it's just, um, you know, there are thousands of positions out there. If you look on the state government website, you can find boards and commissions. I encourage you to apply for one of those. Um, they're always looking for good folks to fill those slots. Thank you, Senator. And we have a, a resource guide on, on the partnership website. I'll throw in the chat here in a while that if anyone's interested, they can take a look at. Are there other of our panelists who would like to, to share anything in addition? Representative Converse. I would just like, I would just like to add that um, no one should feel that they need to come to the Capitol to engage with us. And especially this year, it can feel a little um, extra intimidating and overwhelming regarding, um, you know, COVID safety and things like that. So please know that um, you may see that people are coming to the Capitol and feel like that's the only way to reach us. But as Representative Sunday said, we're perfectly thrilled to talk with you on on the phone or email or text or letters. So um, don't feel that that way is any less effective in reaching out to us. So we wanna make sure that you're comfortable talking with us. And if that means um, an email instead of coming to the Capitol, that is totally fine. Thank you. 
why don't I I'll switch to the next question. And this is combining a, a pre-submitted question with Catherine's uh, question that she put in the chat. So thank you for that, Catherine. And uh, the question is, uh, really what can we do what can you do what can we all do to work together bring people together but but the pre-submitted question was also about how do we how do you respond to those who are more apathetic towards local and, and, and state politics and and just how do we get people engaged in those conversations to want to work together uh even if maybe they're they're not willing and i'm gonna maybe start with a representative judge do you want to can you kick us off with this question you bet. Thank you. Um, I think it's I think it's a great question and one that uh, that I'll say one person can make a difference. Okay, how you handle yourself, how you communicate, what you say matters. And um, I can just speak for myself that I try to look at every issue on both sides and learn about it. And I've tried to make a a point that you know if it's a good bill and it's uh, not one that came from my caucus, I'm gonna vote yes on it. And I think people watch and they understand and they know who will work together. So to me, it's no different than my 38 year business career. You treat people how you wanna be treated. Uh, words matter, attacks matter, what you say matter and, uh, and how you come across. So uh, to me, I don't consider myself a politician I consider, I consider myself a business leader that wants to do good in the community and, and retire and have the time to do that now. So I do think one person can make a difference and it starts with each and every one of us. And I think part of the question was, how, how do you get in the same way? Um, I think we just, we do it one person at a time. And, and I look forward to getting back to session. There's a, I think, uh, Andrea, the, one of the things you said when we first kicked it off, there's a lot of things that we, work on together. I know a lot of times the media just covers what, uh, you know, maybe is the hot topic of the day and, and maybe a little more controversial because it makes good news, but there's a lot of good legislation that's being conducted and a lot of ideas being thrown out there uh, in a bipartisan fashion. And I think it's all about attitude and how you conduct yourself. So thank you. Thank you, Representative. Anything to add from our, our other panelists? I'd love Senator, to jump yeah. in. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, thank you. Um, it, it, in this time, it's been so hard to spend time with other people. We don't have the usual means of running into folks, um, making new connections. We have to be very intentional about meeting new people. And it's been tough with a lot of folks, you know, their connections are through their social media networks can be pretty limited. And so finding ways to um, engage with people who are different than you and get to know them it's it's so important and I think the chamber plays an important role in this and giving people venues and opportunities to meet one another and to connect with each other and so thank you for doing that work um, to remember that you know people who have different political opinions than us people who um, have different um, perspectives on issues aren't our enemies um, they're our neighbors and that we need to remember that um, these are people who are part of our community, um, regardless of where we fall on issues, and we need to find common ground and build relationships with one another so that the divisive rhetoric that we're hearing often on social media doesn't um, you know, turn us against one another because we saw the violence yesterday. And we, we need to remember um, that we are connected um, and that we are in this together. Um, and, keep that in mind, keep those relationships so that we can work together on the big issues that are facing us. Thank you, Senator. Representative Sundy, did you wanna add in there? Yeah, she's absolutely right. I just think none of us should be shocked um, that people would rather duck their heads and turn off the TV and put down their phone and hide, or many people, rather than engage in what they feel like is, ju is just ugly politics right now. And so, leaders um, need, political leaders need to start with setting the right tone. And we, we all know that. And my colleagues are, are wonderful and, and they are good at talking about policy rather than personalities. Um, and so, but we, we all need to expect that from government leaders at every level. So I think that's one step in changing that rhetoric. Um, and then, you know, those people that 
just don't want to deal with that conflict, don't want to hear it anymore, um, can hopefully kind of peek their heads back up and feel like they can re-engage. Um, and, and I think that's the first place to start. And then also reminding them that, you know, the closer government is to you, the more impact it has on your life. So what's happening in the city is so important and the county level and the state level, probably more so than what's happening at the federal level. And so keep reminding people that what, what's closest to you is what's impacting you most. And so, um, you know, do engage and do under go to a city council meeting or, you know, talk to your city council members and find out what's going on. So, so changing that tone and we as leaders can do it and, and uh, the public can do it as they're engaging from behind their screens, which we're doing an awful lot of lately. I'm not sure that's been the, the best thing for society, but uh, it's something to keep in mind. Thank you, Representative. I will think I'll go to the next question, but please feel free to um, unmute. I, I'm paying attention in, in that way. So thanks to, to our panelists for, for prompting me with your unmuting. Uh, so the next question and has been asked, but also sort of, of answered in the chat, but uh, Representative Comfer, so I'm gonna to toss this one to you. The question is from Sue Huppert with uh, DMU and Sue asks about telehealth. And she says, we've found during the pandemic, the importance of access to healthcare for our citizens. The value of telehealth has been experienced by so many, but there's not uh, parity in payment. Do you believe this can change during the session with a bipartisan approach? I am so glad that I get this question because telehealth parity is on the top three issues that I am facing this legislative session. I've seen the benefits directly. I've also seen the benefits in my own family about being able to have telehealth access via mental health as I have kids in college and, and it's really helped through this transition for people. Um, so I think that telehealth is a critically important aspect to life going forward. And I think telehealth parity is what's going to make that possible for us. So that means essentially the providers get paid the same amount of money whether they see you virtually or see you in person. And um, I've heard some, some you know, talk about, we, we've currently got agreements to keep telehealth parity going through February. We would like to make that permanent. And um, there are negotiations going on right now about what that looks like. There's some fear it, that um, people will separate, that, that um, legislation will be separated so that mental health parity is treated differently than physical health parity. And um, so that they may be used as negotiating tactics against each other. My hope is that doesn't happen. I've heard from both uh, members of the majority party and the minority party that this is a priority of theirs. So I'm hopeful we can come to some sort of um, agreement. Insurance companies have different um, perspectives on this than providers, than um, patients, of course. And so it's managing that conversation. But um, this is one of those things that is a top priority, I know, for me and my caucus and making sure that um, people can continue to access the health care they need wherever they are. I, I can't imagine that if I lived in a rural area that I would see anything other than benefits to telehealth parity um, because it allows people in rural areas to reach the doctors and providers that they wouldn't otherwise be able to reach. It's just better for everyone. And so my hope is that, and, and my expectation is, that this will be a big topic for us and that um, we can try to get something done. However, I am concerned about this idea of separating out the two um, because I do fear that that will pit them against each other, which will then um, make telehealth parity as a concept as a whole um, a little less uh, likely than it is if we keep everything together and just look at, at providing that parity. Thank you, Representative. Others that may want to add to representative's question, answer. All right, well, and I know if you scroll down, you'll see Senator Celsius' response to that as well. So the next question, so we can get in a, a few more, hopefully. The next question is from, from Jeffrey, and, and Senator Celsius, we'll start with you since the question is, is directed at you, but offer everyone a chance to respond if, if interested. So you mentioned the uh, diversity statement that you're wanting to include with uh, legislation as it's going through the process, but um, how will you also work to assure diversity beyond ethnicity and, and ensuring that other minority groups that are often discriminated against are included in that? Thanks for the question, Jeffrey. Um, there is a law in state government that requires a minority impact statement that was passed several years back Unfortunately, it's gone by the wayside, meaning that 
Um, usually it's a Democrat requesting a minority in, impact statement from the LSA, which is the Legislative Services Agency, which is a nonpartisan group that provides uh, budget numbers on how um, our budget will be impacted and how a minority group may be impacted. Um, unfortunately, not all bills get a minority impact statement at this time, which I think is wrong. So we're gonna, first thing we're gonna do is keep requesting the minority in impact statements for every bill that we feel it's applicable. The second thing we can do is include other groups in that discussion. As Jeffrey mentioned, LGBTQ groups, women, um, elderly uh, populations in our state may be groups that are not uh, actually included in that law. However, that's where constituent uh, impact and service on our part comes in. It behooves us to reach out to those groups and be open to their commentary um, and be able to introduce individual legislation. For example, I'm in, introducing a hate crime bill for the second session in a row uh, as it specifically impacts LBGTQ community. Um, so it's up to us to just keep moving forward on those, keep introducing bills, keep um, the subject at hand um, relevant just by our conversations with our constituents. Thank you, Senator. Others that would like to, Representative come first. Sorry, I know you're getting tired of hearing from me. I promise this is gonna okay. be short. I just <laughs> wanted to let you know that in the House, in the House, um, any bill that has a criminal penalty on it already is required to have a minority impact statement. Um, but that we in the House will also be working and continue to, we've done this for for years, as Senator Selsey said, to, to try to get a minority impact statement put on other legislation as well. What we've heard is there's not possibly time to put a minority impact statement on everything because it does require some work and research on the part of LSA. Uh, we do feel like there's a um, there's a compromise that can be made in there that's more than just what's happening now and less than every single bill. I don't know that we need a minority impact statement for every time we're changing the weight limit on a, on a highway, for example, um, I, but I do think we can find some common ground there. Thank you. For, for our next question, uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Senator Trunk area. And the question came from uh, Coco Creative. And I, I also see Senator Selsey gave a response in the, in the chat. But the question here is, um, is there anything being done to either change or increase spending goals for our minority owned businesses or target, targeted small business programs? Um, so I'm not aware of anything in particular that's coming through, but I think it's really important to look at, especially with our CARES Act money, how it was distributed and who might've been missed. Um, because I know that that process perhaps did not have as much transparency or oversight um, that would have benefited it. Um, we need to support our minority owned businesses and make sure that um, we are giving opportunities to our entrepreneurs in this community and especially those who um, might be missing out on opportunities because of some of the structural inequity in our system and some of the history in our community that we need to rectify. And so I, I would like to learn more about how we can, how we can do that in this session um, and some areas of interest. So kind of relating to the minority impact statements on bills, you know, we have a process in which we're supposed to get public input on our legislation and legislators ideally would be talking to their communities and bringing forth ideas from the community. Um, and that doesn't always happen. And so I'm hoping that in this session with all of the limitations that COVID presents that we still um, create opportunities for people to give their input and that we see legislators really seeking out that input from the community and listening to it to make sure that the legislation is what serves our community well. Thank you, Senator. Other responses that anyone would like to add to Senator Salsi? Yes, um, I think this is a role that perhaps the Secretary of State could pick up some responsibility in. Currently, as you know, if you have a small business, you pay a fee every couple of years, you fill out some paperwork and boom, you're a small business in the state of Iowa. 
However, some of the benefits and responsibilities and opportunities of being a small business owner aren't necessarily um, you know, reflected back by the Secretary of State's office. Um, I think they could be doing a better job in reaching out to small businesses and letting them know the opportunities that exist. And then also in the chat, I responded that I think chambers of commerce can be a bridge in this way to uh, reach out to their minority owned business owners in their jurisdictions and let them know what opportunities exist. Helping them apply for PPP loans would be one example and also helping them become a minority owned business vendor for the state of Iowa, which can bring significant contracts your way. So those are two ways I think uh, the state and other groups could be doing a better job. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. And I'll also just share with everyone, I see uh, Jane Armstrong with the U.S. Small Business Administration has, has shared some comments in here in her email, um, although uh, fed, a little bit more federally focused, uh, certainly another resource and uh, for, for those with um, small businesses. And um, she notes here, there will be money dedicated to the CDFIs and other lending organizations to help out. Uh, and I know there's a new CDFI that has been created in in our region to, to support that work. So, and uh, thank you for, for those responses. Any other responses from our panelists? I have a couple of questions that have come in sort of just to me on the back end. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to those. And, and the first one, I'll start with Representative Sundy. Let me scroll here to make sure I get back to it. Okay, uh, so the, the question, well, first is uh, an expression of, of concern that in our, our zeal to deal with COVID, we've, we've made changes that serve perhaps a short-term urgency, but may have lost sight of the potential domino effect and unintended consequences. So uh, for instance, um, temptation to change standards to address the public health crisis that we're dealing with, but without the broader consideration of the future impact of, of other institutions. Are there Per considerations for sunsets to uh, legislation or, or some of those changes? And, and what could those be revisited when um, the public health issues don't loom so large? Is that something you've thought of? I know that's a, uh, uh, maybe not my best representation of the question that came to me, but uh, Representative Sunday, any response to that? Yeah, I think, you know, everything was so new when we were first trying to deal with COVID that we were making decisions quickly and trying to figure out the best course. And now that we have more months under our belt and we, we've been able to talk about and look at the impacts of different different moves that governments have made, I think we have a better handle on how um, we really need to find a good balance. And so, yeah, I think it's absolutely appropriate to go back to session and all of us talk together about everything, education, um, you know, our healthcare system, our small businesses and, and figure out like, what is the best course? It, nothing's going to be perfect. And I wish that, you know, the public could keep remembering that there are no perfect solutions in this. We're just doing the very best we can to get through it. Um, and so the more feedback we can get from the public about how this is affecting their, their health and their livelihoods, the better, but it's absolutely now that we have a little more understanding and a light at the end of the tunnel about, you know, getting through this with the vaccines. Um, I think it's, it's a great idea to regroup and figure out how do we get through these next months as safely as possible, but, but ensuring that we're protecting our economy as much as possible as well. Thank you, Representative. Other responses from our panelists, Representative. A lot of the a lot of the uh, the restrictions that have been put in place and things like that are part of the governor's emergency declaration as well. And so um, she continues to expand that. But as that expires, some of these um, measures will also expire. So that's another thing to remember is that we're making long term policy decisions, but some of the emergency orders are temporary when it comes to that. Thank you. All right, well, I, I know we have a couple more questions sitting here and uh, I'm, I'm hoping if you're willing, we can do a quick lightning round with two of them. One that came to me and, and one that's in the chat that I, I hope are a quick yes or no uh, response before we give everyone a chance for a closing comment. And, and the first one is, is about the backfill, uh, the property tax backfill. So the quick question is, do you plan to continue uh, 
support the current promised funding level for the backfill? Yes or no? Maybe maybe use your reactions if you if you can the the thumbs up or, or thumbs down or, or or your actual thumb up or thumb down. Great, I think we've got some thumbs up from, from everyone. So uh, we got that question answered. So the next lightning round question here is about uh, from, excuse me, Robin with the Alzheimer's Associations. And, and just to share her question, uh, we've, we've seen the toll that social isolation has had on the population that they serve. They know that with that isolation, there's potential for abuse, criminal and financial. And, and will you support increased penalties for those who commit elder abuse? And, and that might require a little bit more explanation from someone, but uh, either give us a thumbs up, thumbs down, or, or unmute to answer. Senator Salsi, did you wanna say something? I think all of us would support that. However, I think it's important to remember that this was going on before the pandemic because we've completely underfunded all of the groups in our state uh, government that monitor elder abuse, uh, the Department of Aging, uh, as well as the Ombudsman's Office. Uh, our five state ombudsmen that deal with nursing homes have had their funding for their cars taken away from them for the last two years in other words, they're not able to visit those nursing homes in person, which I think is a travesty. So we need to restore funding to the groups that monitor elder abuse and uh, get it back to you know levels from 10 years ago, which were higher than they are now. So um, it's a matter of funding and getting those monitors back in the nursing homes and getting uh, you know, eyes on the bodies in the places where they are instead of on Zoom, which is not good for anyone. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. And, and thank you, Senator Trone Garriott for your comments in, in the chat. Uh, knowing that we've got five minutes left and I still have to turn it to Catherine and there may be a couple other questions. Uh, I'll work with the, the chambers to grab any questions we missed and, and to get those in front of the panelists so that then we can share those with, with those that asked the question. But uh, wanted to give just last uh, 30 seconds, if you will, comments and, and Representative Judge, if, if you would kick us off with any closing comments before we wrap up today, I'll start with you. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for having us. Um, I do think one area that we need to look at in our state for economic growth, I know we've talked a lot about COVID and education, is one area is housing and workforce housing. If we're going to grow this state and we're going to get the economic, or we're going to get the, the, the growth we deserve, that's something that this year that I'm going to be focused on. One area in particular that if I get a group like this together, I do mention is a mobile home. Um, and I can't really sit here and explain it all today because we wouldn't have the time. But um, if anybody has questions on it, uh, we have uh, in our state, we have uh, a lot of outside investment firms uh, coming in and buying mobile homes. The last check I had was uh, communities and folks are seeing their rents double. And uh, I'm a capitalist. I believe in capitalism. But when it affects people that are on fixed income and uh, losing their homes and being unrightfully evicted from these mo mobile homes. It's something that we need to make sure uh, that we that we work on this year and, and get solved. Um, it, you know, I, I believe all politics are local. It's happened right here in Waukee and many, many others across the state. So housing is important and a mobile home community legislation to protect uh, folks that own their own home is very important as well. So I did want to end on that. I do want to thank you for all being here today. Uh, feel free to reach out to me personally at any time. Uh, I'm glad to talk, discuss anything further with you uh, that you would like. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Senator Trung Garriott, will you go next, please? Um, thank you all for having us here today. Like I said, it's so important to have community groups that bring folks together to build relationships and help share the things that are um, impacting our lives. And so, um, you know, the, the 
there's so many important things to work on and um, I'm excited to begin at the Capitol. Um, there's a lot to learn and I'm always happy to visit with folks directly. And I mentioned in our breakout room time, I've been doing a lot of masked walk and talks with people. Always glad to go on a walk with you regardless of the weather and um, talk about what's on your minds. and really appreciate um, all the ways that you all are in leadership in your communities. I see lots of people on this call that I know um, and know about the important work you're, you're doing. So thank you for being here today. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Sundy. Thank you. Yeah, and just echoing everyone else, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk. And I do want to encourage everyone to um, please reach out anytime. As you can imagine, we have every kind of issue flying at us all day long. We, our days will vote on you know, 20 bills and there are lots of different topics. And so the more understanding knowledge I can get about a certain issue and how it impacts people in the community, how it impacts your business is really, really helpful. So the more you reach out and tell me what's going on, what you need, what would be best for you, um, that's great. So please email me, call me anytime. And, and I appreciate that feedback. Thank you, Representative. Senator Selsey. Thank you so much for the opportunity today. And I wanna bring up one more issue that was not discussed, but I think is pertinent. And that is our direct care workforce, direct care professionals or anything from a CNA in a nursing home to an individual that works with someone uh, who's disabled on a daily basis doing daily care for them. Um, we have the opportunity in our state, and there's an exciting conversation taking place right now with uh, myself and a few other senators, and I'm sure in, in the House as well, uh, of creating a more professionalized workforce for direct service providers uh, to give them a career path and to raise their wages. What we're experiencing, and this was exacerbated by COVID, is many, many of these folks have two and three jobs just to make ends meet, and they're making $11 an hour, $10, $11 an hour, which is not enough for this very difficult and important work. So we're hoping to work with uh, community colleges, high schools, um, all kinds of groups to make sure that this direct care workforce that we have this burgeoning workforce is cared for and given a career path so that they can serve um, the thousands and thousands of Iowans who rely on them every day and create a more stable workforce. So that's something uh, really exciting that I'm working on that I just wanted to share and thank you all for having us again today and be sure to contact us anytime, thank you. Thank you, Senator, and, and wrap us up and bring us home, Representative Con first. Sorry, you'd think I'd have mute ready to go. Um, so thank you everybody for being here and for, for this conversation. It's really productive and understanding and hearing what issues you care about. It's heartening always to hear that the issues you care about are the ones that we're focused on or prioritizing. So thanks for having us. I just wanna say a brief thing about um, what did happen at the Capitol yesterday and kind of what that says about how we're heading into our session. Um, obviously, peaceful resolution of conflict is a critical part of our democracy, and it's a critical part of what we do at the Capitol. I want to let you know that um, those of us who work together in the Capitol disagree on issues and ideas from time to time regularly, in fact, and yet we sit together um, in the, on the floor, we, we work together, we talk together about bills and in committee, and we know that we are people and colleagues who care a lot about each other, and that sort of fundamental priority of knowing that we're there to do the people's business and that we value and engage in a civilized um, exchange of ideas, not only with each other, but with the public is a critical important part of what we do. It's something we put ahead of all else and know that we will continue our commitment to that kind of conversation, that kind of discourse. And we will expect nothing less from those who come to the Capitol and those who work with us. And we look forward to continuing to have peaceful, uh, if not heated from time to time conversations, because at the end of the day, we're all Iowans. We're all focused on um, getting past recovering from COVID and also making Iowa the great place that we all know and love. That's our priority. And we expect the same and have no reason to think anything else when we go back to the Capitol on Monday. Thank you, Representative. And, and well, thanks for having us. 
Thank you. Catherine, sorry to keep it go a little long. Thank you for uh, today. It's been incredible. We've all learned so much. And Andrea, you did a beautiful job moderating these incredible, incredible leaders. Thank you so much to our representatives for being here. And, and I echo what Renee and, and Bo both say here in the chat. You know, thank you to our elected officials for their service, for their time this morning. It's so important to learn what your priorities are. And they are all, like you said, echoed, very important to everybody else. So um, I wrote a few notes, though, that I thought were per wonderfully relevant. Uh, what Keenan Judge mentioned, what you say matters, words matter. Uh, treat people the way they want to be treated. That is a fabulous pillar. It's all about attitude and boy, here, here, that is so true. Sarah mentioned engaging with people that are different than you, different perspectives and how important is that gonna be in 2021? Sarah mentioned build relationships with one another. We are in this together. I love what Kristen said, setting the tone, what is closest to you is what impacts you the most. And I love how she mentioned, go to city council meetings. If you wanna know what's going on in your backyard, in your community, in your neighborhood, attend city council meetings. I started doing that this year. I've attended almost every single one of them. And the good news is too, they are all online. So if you wanna be super safe, you can go online and watch them as well. And you will also understand how hard these people work for you and on your behalf. They work tirelessly and they all have full-time jobs as well at the same time. So it's, it's incredible the work that they do. And I applaud each and every one of you for, for sticking up for our communities and our, and our citizens. So a little side note, we are taping this today. Uh, so the good news is you can reflect, look back on this. This will be on YouTube and Bailey, uh, our amazing event leader here. She will be sending you the link so you can share it with others. And we do, uh, we do hope you do so. So thanks so much. And uh, we just really appreciate everybody's time today. And we always end up every meeting by saying, stay positive and test negative everybody. So thank you for being here.